really great to see a good cross-section of people here this evening as well. We have got a lot of students here. We've got some ex-students, some lecturers. We have Ken, who surpasses all other roles. And obviously, a, a lot of visitors from outside the program as well. So thank you all very much for coming. I just thought before we got into proceedings, just to set the tone perhaps a little bit, I thought it was quite interesting that today we're getting together, we're having a conversation all about the future of IT and what's coming next, and yet on the same day, possibly one of the most influential people in the IT world for the last, at least my generation, uh, and probably before that, has passed away, as everyone's probably heard about Steve Jobs, so a really sad day for for IT and for technology and again it, it, it was interesting to me especially because we are talking about the future and going forward and Steve Jobs would have probably been a fairly safe bet he would have been one of the biggest influences on what happens in the next 10 years so really interesting on that some of you may or may not know Mark has worked at, at Apple uh, in the past so he might be able to share a few stories later over a beer I'm sure there are plenty of good general California Silicon Valley stories to come out of that. So tonight my primary job is just to chair the meeting and keep us on track and give us uh, the, the right context for, for Mark's speech and I'll definitely get to Mark and give him the proper introduction in a moment. I think the most important thing is this event for us is consistent with all of the values and the, the mission and the vision of the ITMP or the, the MBITM. It's all about leadership and, and growing into the roles and in the industries that uh, have an influence on, on the economy. It's all about ongoing education and it's very much about networking and networked events which is what we're having here today. So uh, a great opportunity to indulge all three of those, uh, those key points. I'll give you a quick run over of the agenda today. After my brief introduction, We'll obviously get straight into the main event and I'll give you a, a proper introduction to Mark in, in just a moment. The Mark speech will go for probably around 35 to 40 minutes and then we'll have a good opportunity for some Q&A after that session. So I think I'd, and, and I would encourage you in advance to have a good think during the speech and, and have some good topical questions ready for when we get to that part of the evening. After that, we'll wrap things up. Uh, say a few quick thank yous and then we'll all get together for a drink down the road at the, uh, the Australian Youth Hotel. Drinks, we have a room booked upstairs from 8 till 10. My research tells me that if you want to kick on after that, the pub does stay open till about midnight. I only know that from the website, no other <laughs> personal first-hand experience. So hopefully we can all get together there and, and have a good, uh, a good conversation after all of that. And that will obviously conclude events at that point. So I'd just like to give you a bit of an introduction to Mark. Mark is a lot of things, as I've discovered after having met him recently and also having followed a lot of the, the commentary that, that Mark has out there in, the, in cyberspace and various other places. I think it was easier to break down all of the things that Mark is into a couple of quick categories. Um, and this will give you, I guess, some context about his vast experience and knowledge and where it all comes from. So first of all, Mark's an inventor. Many of you may or may not know this, but Mark was actually one of the co-founders of VRML, which is virtual reality, I think, markup? Modeling. Modeling language, thank you. And VRML is, is essentially a 3D interface into the web. Now, that's no mean feat. Um, Mark's got a couple of other uh, inventor links in his repertoire as well, and I'll, I'll touch on those in a minute. Mark's also a writer, for those of you who don't know. He's published, I think, five or six books. Going on six. Going on six. Hopefully we'll hear more about that soon. And is also a regular contributor to Net Magazine, the SMH, and numerous other publications as well, which is great. Mark's also an educator. Mark's, apart from being a very sought-after speaker out in uh, the industry and around, he's also uh, had a lot of... Uh, involvement with the university and, and tonight again. Mark was involved in setting up the graduate programs uh, in both universities in, in Sydney and in the US around interactive media. So again, a, a really big contribution there which is fantastic. Mark's also a broadcaster, if he didn't have enough on his plate already. Mark will probably tell you all about his day today if you're following Mark and you're one of his 23,000 Twitter followers. 
Uh, you'll know that Mark's already been on national television today and on national radio uh, with some commentary around Steve Jobs and, and the events of the last, uh, last day or so. Um, lastly, I thought it was interesting in how Mark actually came to be here tonight. Uh, some of you may or may not know that Mark's connected to the, uh, the ITMP or the MBIT through one of our students. So Nicola, I don't believe, is here tonight, but will be joining us later this evening for a drink. So um, again, a great opportunity for networking and a great example of networking. One more quick point, just to, to set, really set the scene for tonight and, and to give Mark the proper introduction. This is a, a brief text, so excuse me for reading off my notes, but I want to do it justice. Um, this is a brief blurb uh, that Mark's given me, and I'd just like to read it to you to set the scene, and then we'll get right into, into business. Our pervasively connected culture has opened the doors to the greatest economic uh, transformation of our lifetimes. Fishermen in India, farmers in Kenya, barbers in Pakistan, and everybody else, everywhere, rich or poor, have plugged into a global network. Friction that has always surrounded the formation of markets dissolves under the pressure of that hyperconnectivity. Businesses find themselves on the back foot, forced to become more fluid, while their customers and employees simultaneously become vastly more capable. The concept of employment, an artifact of the Industrial Revolution is being replaced by something that resembles freelancing, but in name only. Everybody has access to the tools and the techniques which let anyone, anywhere, build their own value chains with little more than a few clicks of their mouse. Our economic future is inextricably bound up with the network, with the billions who are already there, connected, trading, and changing the way that money is made. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mark Pesci. Sebastian, thank you very much for that awesome introduction. I was sort of wondering who that person was about halfway through, because they would not have time to do things like give talks. They'd be way too busy for that sort of thing. And uh, let me thank Stefano. It was very nice to be invited to come and give a talk here. I do a lot of public speaking that I get paid for, and when I do that, I really have to conform to what the client wants, because that's what you do when you're getting paid. Hold on, I have to turn on the spy watch. Just give me a second here, folks. We're going to make an audio recording of the talk with the spy watch. And uh, no, seriously, it is a spy watch. I'm not making this up. And we're recording. Excellent. Good. OK. So now I've got an audio recording here. <laughs> um, it's really nice to get an opportunity to be able to talk in an environment where I can talk about the ideas that I specifically am interested in and the ideas that I'm working into a book. So come with me on this little journey if you could. Now what happens when we're all connected together? This is a question that I asked myself seven years ago. And at that time, already over 80% of Australians had a mobile phone. Over 50% of Australians had signed up for or were about to start receiving broadband. So the answer to that question, which has been seven years in developing, led me on a journey through the future of media, and then education, and then politics, and now into economics. And in July, I actually sat down and started to set out the research outcomes in a book that's called The Next Billion Seconds. And actually, what you're getting tonight is not this book. You're getting the book that comes after it. Now, a billion seconds is just over 30 years. It's a generation. And it's my belief that the billion seconds between 1995 and 2026 will be as important in human history as the birth of language 70,000 years ago. Because being connected means being something new. Now, here in this room tonight and everywhere else on the planet, we are all in the middle of this transition. We're halfway between what we were and what we are becoming. That has always been true, but just at this moment, the transformation of our, uh, of our civilization is going into overdrive. It's because all of the frictions that kept the civilization sort of chugging along at a regular rate, all of those frictions have vanished. And so we're moving, if you were, into a superconducting phase of civilization without any resistance to hold us back. And so stripped of all of this baggage, we are now accelerating wildly. 
we're accelerating into a future that looks almost nothing like the present. But let me start off with a story from the past. For a couple of thousands of years, fishermen in the Indian state of Kerala, which is on the southwestern coast of India, have gotten up before the sun, gotten in their boats, gone out to sea, dropped their nets, said a few prayers, dragged their nets in, and brought the sea's bounty on aboard their craft. And after they fill their holds, they trim their sails, and they turn back toward port. And for all of these thousands of years, those fishermen have been faced with a question, because the Kerala coast is dotted with ports. So where do they want to go and sell their fish that day? Because every one of those ports has a fish market, and every day those fish markets need more fish. And so, basically based on memory and instinct, the fishermen would pick a port that day, and they'd sail into it. Now, inevitably, there would be other fishermen who would have exactly the same idea. Too many boats would pull into a port, there would be too many fish, and the fishermen wouldn't be able to get a good price for their catch because of the law of supply and demand. Meanwhile, there would be another port that would be just another kilo, a, a few kilometers away. No one pulled into that port that day. There is no fish for sale in that port for any price whatsoever. And this Inequality had always existed. The Carolyn fishermen had gotten used to the fact that they were just going to make a subsistence living off their catch, and the Carolyn fish markets were used to the fact that on some days there just weren't going to be any fish to sell. That's the way things were. It's the way things had always been. But in the 1990s, the Indian government started to auction radio spectrum off, and in 1997, mobile service arrived in Kerala, and that gave Kerala excellent mobile coverage because radio signals travel in straight lines and because the Indian government lets you put up a mast anywhere you want, literally you just put up a mast and plug it in and you're off, don't have to fill out any forms, the entire seacoast of Kerala was dotted with mobile masts, which means that the signal could go out to sea because there was nothing to block it, 20 kilometers, and that means that you could make a phone call from the middle of the Indian Ocean. Now. Mobile phones in 1997 in Kerala cost the equivalent of a month's income for a fisherman. So in Australian terms, $4,000. That would be the equivalent to five iPhones. So only the richest fishermen who had fleets actually managed to buy phones. And at some point, someday, when that fisherman was out to sea, their phone rang and there was a call from the mainland and they had a conversation and during that conversation that fisherman found out that there was a port that had no fish that day and the fisherman made for that port and docked and made a bunch of money. And the next day the fisherman is out, of, out to sea and he calls a series of ports to figure out which one needs fish that day. Finds out which port needs fish, pulls in, makes more money, and it does the same thing the day after that and the day after that. Now, the fishermen in Kerala are a, are a community. They all talk to one another. They might not share their favorite places for fishing, but they're going to share the various trips of the trade. And so the news of this mobile fish market spread throughout the entire length and breadth of the state. And in very little time, every fisherman, however rich or poor, had their own mobile, and they were all calling in to the markets to select a port of call. And so three things happened as a result. One, every fish market now had an adequate supply of fish. Two, the price of fish from market to market equalized. And three, the fishermen got their best possible price for the fish every single day. In fact, that mobile, which had cost a month's income, paid for itself in two months. That's how much more money they were making. So all of the inefficiencies that are associated with human communication fell away as the Carolyn fishermen got these mobiles, as they extended their reach. And it improved the circumstances for both the buyers and sellers. It created a win-win situation. That friction that kept the fishermen poorly informed and poorly resourced melted away under the heat of connectivity. In other words, the dross of market inefficiency burned off and it left the gold of commerce. 
And that happened not because of some top-down mandate, but from a bottom-up process in which people connect, share what they know, learn from one another, and put that learning to work. Now, Kerala was an early example of this, but it's not the only example. Farmers who are forever at the mercy of weather and insects and crop lights. Farmers suffer from what's called informational asymmetry in the market. That is, when they go to the market, the buyers know more than the farmers do, and so therefore, the buyers are always getting a better deal than the farmers. But hyperconnectivity has disrupted that informational arbitrage that the buyers have been using. So in Kenya, farmers use something called Drumnet. It's an SMS-based service that allows them to check the current market prices for goods in a range of markets. So that when a farmer readies the crop for sale, he sends a message off to Drumnet, says, OK, these are the markets and these are the prices for that crop. And he then goes to the market that will give him the best return for those efforts. And so, with Drumnet, these Kenyan farmers have been earning 40% more for their crops, just because they have access to better information. And it makes the cost of sending a few SMSs, which is just a few pennies, a very good investment. Now, the Drumnet concept has started to spread across the developing world. In India, when you buy a Nokia phone, it comes equipped with something called Life Tools. It's a service that farmers employ to get the latest and greatest information about markets, about crops, about weather conditions. Nokia makes a tiny little profit off of, this, uh, off the service, but they know that the service is so valuable to the farmers that it will become ubiquitously used among them. And that means that farmers in India and then in Bangladesh and in Pakistan will now be earning more for their produce. So each of these farmers, now hyper-connected, has the same access to informational resources as the best resourced farmers anywhere in the world. The mobile also frees the market from a place and attaches it to a person. In Karachi, Barbers have always had to rent an expensive booth inside the market to ply their trade. But when Pakistan crossed over into hyperconnectivity, which happened three or four years ago, a different kind of commerce became possible. If you're a barber in Karachi, what you can do is you can buy a mobile, you can buy a bicycle, and then get a bunch of signs printed that say, if you want to shave, call, and then put your mobile number on it. And you stick these up all over town. And then clients will contact you directly, mobile to mobile and they'll get on-call service inside their homes. And so everyone's better served by this relationship because the client's getting service at home at the time of their choosing, and the barber is establishing a better relationship with that client while saving the cost of renting space in the market. So think about this. This is happening in the middle of the oldest market civilization in the world. These are the civilizations of the Silk Road. And all of a sudden, by the addition of hyperconnectivity, the entire relationship of the human being to the market has been transformed. So the hyperconnectivity created by the mobile dramatically improves an individual's ability to earn a living. To own a mobile in Bangladesh or Peru or Nigeria means that you have a greater capability to keep yourself and your family fed. And this effect is completely obvious to everyone. So everyone in the developing world has been acquiring mobiles as quickly as they can. In the decade from 1999 to 2009, we went from half the world having never made a phone call to half the world owning their own mobile. And we're now well past that point because there are now over 6 billion mobile subscriptions and almost five and a half billion individuals using mobiles right this minute. And if the current growth patterns are sustained by 2016, every single person, all seven billion of us, will have their own mobile. Now, under the pressure of hyperconnectivity, 
all friction in markets, wherever they are, begins to melt. So everything is becoming smooth, it's becoming slick, it's becoming slippery and very fast. And Australia is no different than in the de developing world. But in Australia, it takes different forms because we started from a different technological base. I want to focus on one example, Kogan. How many of you own a Kogan television set? Okay, okay, so there's two of you who own a Kogan television set. So, Ruslan Kogan's, very profitable consumer electronics enterprise. What happened was Kogan realized that the value chain created by the large television manufacturers, the Samsungs and the Sonys of the world, that that value chain rested with a few Chinese companies that assembled the raw components for televisions. And Kogan knew that he could get these Chinese companies to build televisions for him if he could order them in sufficient quantity. So what did he do? He turned to the web to create enough demand to dissolve the frictions to the transaction. The web provides a frictionless environment where purchasers can pool their needs around Kogan's ability to deliver via a value chain. Now, Jerry Harvey has been very busily complaining that Kogan undercuts his retail business, but actually the innovation is much more fundamental. It's not just e-commerce. Kogan is using the web as an aggregation mechanism, not a sales channel. And eventually, other people are going to start to copy the Kogan model. They're going to start aggregating demand for almost every imaginable product and service. Groupon and Spreets, for example, they cut off price deals with businesses, and then they take a cut of the sales because they aggregate demand for the services those businesses are offering. And so the most disruptive businesses of 2011 are the ones that identify a demand, build a value chain to service that demand, aggregate the demand in sufficient quantity, and then produce a substantial price differential. Now, Kogan itself is built upon frictions that exist in the marketplace. It's not easy for me to go directly to a Chinese manufacturer and say, hi, I'd like a nice, big, cheap, flat-screen television. So Kogan is an at present necessary intermediary between the manufacturer and the marketplace. He's the point of aggregation. And that interface only exists for as long as the manufacturer holds itself aloof from the market. But eventually, one of these manufacturers is going to figure it out and they're going to develop a value chain which allows them to accommodate single customer orders. And when that happens, Kogan's model collapses just as Jerry Harvey's model has already collapsed. But there are a number of other businesses taking advantage of the frictionless environment provided by hyperconnectivity. One of them is named Uber, and it's begun to disrupt the taxi market. Now, it was launched late last year in San Francisco, and when you sign up for Uber, you download a smartphone app. The smartphone app uses GPS to detect where you are, and it shows you a map of the locale, and then it shows you real-time information about cars that are nearby that can come pick you up. And you transmit a request to be picked up, one of the cars receives it, accepts it, the other cars disappear, and then you watch in real time as the car comes to pick you up. And let me tell you, as someone who tried to call a Sydney taxi to bring me over here tonight, I would like this, because the taxi never came. Now, the cars that are employed by Uber to do this are standard black limousines. They're used all across America for, uh, for airport and executive transfers. And the drivers sitting in their cars are running a companion iPhone app that allows them to see when the orders come in and allows them to bid on those orders. They don't have to bid on all of those orders. What it allow, Uber allows them to do is it allows them to slot these orders in in between their regularly scheduled pickups and drop-offs. And that's good for the drivers because drivers normally spend 50% of their time down in between jobs, waiting for jobs to show up. And so the drivers are making a lot more for each shift worked because the inefficiencies of hiring a driver have been removed because Uber has been able to aggregate both supply and demand. 
Now, I had the opportunity when I was in San Francisco to interview several Uber drivers, and every one of them praised the service to the skies. It's more expensive from my point of view as a customer than a taxi, but Uber makes the process of booking and paying so frictionless because you don't have to hand them any money. It's all handled with the credit card that you used when you signed up for Uber. It's so frictionless that it makes sense for almost everyone except for people who are really pinching their pennies. So Uber transformed this discreet and amorphous army of cars into a fleet, into a single cohesive entity with just a piece of software. And with that piece of software, they ensured that there would be demand for that fleet. Now the innovation proved so disruptive that San Francisco's taxi companies took Uber to court. They filed suit demanding that the company, which was at the time named Uber Cabs, strike the word cabs from their name. But that hasn't stopped Uber's growth. Already they've gone to New York and to Chicago and to Seattle and to Boston. And every city that has a fleet of black limousines, which includes this one, is now ripe for disruption. Airbnb is another disruptive business, which employs similar strategies around aggregation. Airbnb allows property owners to list properties for short-term rental, and it simultaneously aggregates people who are looking for short-term rentals. And so something that was done normally quite informally or through Craigslist is now smooth and efficient and effortless. And Airbnb is now disrupting the hotel markets in cities like New York and San Francisco where room prices are high because in those cities, not only are the room prices high, but mortgages are so high that people are looking to rent out rooms so they can afford to pay their huge mortgages. And so the same market forces that make these cities expensive to visit also drive customers and supply to Airbnb. And so Airbnb, just by doing this, has suddenly created a very fluid market in short-term rental properties where none existed before because there were marketplace frictions which made it too difficult to connect property owners to renters. And so hyperconnectivity has eliminated these frictions. And Airbnb represents the first pass at what a frictionless home rental market looks like. And the hotel industry is going to follow Sue, too. There's a new company, a new website called Room 77. And it's building an individual database for every hotel room in the world. So that renting a hotel room becomes a process of picking exactly the right room that you want in particularly the right hotel. Now, it's only a short stop between that kind of in-depth information on each room to a complete disaggregation of a hotel into a set of rooms with prices driven by individual demand. Oh, you want the room with a good view? You'll pay more for that. Oh, you want the room that's next to the elevator? We'll give you a cut rate on that. And such a system would have been unthinkable just a few years ago because of the amount of data that had to be massaged. But if you think about it, today it's exactly the kind of task that software as a service cloud computing was made for. And so hotels under pressure from Airbnb will be forced to disaggregate themselves completely in order to compete. So that's transport and housing. Those are two primary sectors of the economy and they're fundamentally being transformed by hyperconnectivity. But the cut goes a lot deeper. It goes to the root. Because labor itself is being transformed by the same pressure. I want you to consider the tweet that crossed my screen last week. Who wants to go to Woolies for me and buy me dog and cat food and some chocolate teddy bear biscuits? And of course, that's the kind of humorous message that we hear all of the time. And on the occasional lazy day, we might even wish it for ourselves but it's always remained in the realm of fantasy. Unless we're fortunate enough to have a personal servant who will do it. However, imagine that there were some way to aggregate the demands of all of these lazy people and matched it to a supply of free labor. Well, if you did that, you'd get Zarly. 
launched in May, Zali offers Americans a smartphone-based interface to a competitive short-term labor pool. As someone who needs labor, you pop your smartphone app open, you post a task, tell it where you are, how, how long it is to get this task completed, and how much you're willing to pay. And that gets tossed over to the labor pool, and anyone interested in the job gets to respond with their own price, at a time frame for completion, and you get to then review these different bids, pick the one, and when the job is completed, money is transferred via your credit card to the person who did the job. And so, as with Airbnb, Zorly is a radical simplification and acceleration of the services that used to be offered through classified papers. Remember those? Back in, before they went away? And Craigslist in America. Zorly aggregates a pool of short-term labor, just as Airbnb aggregates the pool of short-term accommodation, and Uber aggregates the pool of transport vehicles. But Zarly could not have existed before the widespread adoption of smartphones, because the friction of connecting a laborer to the demand was simply too great. And now there's no friction. And because of that, there is no resistance to the aggregation of either the supply or the demand of labor. Now, for a few years, there have been websites like Elance and Freelance.com that have been providing a frictionless way to aggregate individuals offering high-value services. That could be programming, it could be web design, it could be graphic design, animation. And it aggregates them for organizations that need those services. Now, I have a colleague in California, a man named Tyler Crowley, and he used a distributed development team that was based in Russia and in Ukraine and India to develop something called Squeal. It's a website that creates a channel for restaurant patrons to send feedback directly to restaurant management so that that feedback doesn't end up on Yelp where everyone else will see it and it will destroy the reputation of the restaurant. Now, Tyler was able to get this work done quickly, and he was able to fund it out of his own savings because he was able to have freelancers who were working all the way around the world. It wasn't easy because California is on the opposite side of the world from Russia, so he was up a lot in the middle of the night. But he couldn't have afforded to bid competitively for the labor pool of web developers in California to get this done. But what's this telling us is that labor, just like transport and accommodation, has become entirely fluid. It's become subject to none of the frictions which prevented aggregation of supply and demand. And in fact, the law of supply and demand amplifies under the influence of hyperconnectivity. In an environment that is freed from the frictions of the marketplace, there is no room for rent-seeking. There's no room for the kinds of labor practices which keep developed economies stable. And so when I pit my $75 an hour rate against someone in Pakistan who's only asking $30 an hour, how do I survive? And if I cut my rate to $35 an hour, does someone else offer the same service for 15 Now at the moment, Uber sets the rates for its drivers, preventing the race to the bottom. But Uber is just software. Someone's going to come along and create a similar piece of software which allows the transaction participants to negotiate the price, which is what Zarly is already doing. In fact, if I wanted to book a ride through Zarly, I could do that. And so, as these designed-in frictions get designed away, the market opens to market forces that are now accelerated to the speed of light. And all price supports sustained by market frictions collapse. Now, the frictionless free fall of markets doesn't end with the individual laborer. Businesses born out of hyperconnectivity, aggregating demand and supply, the firms like eBay or Airbnb or Uber, they also face a similar round of disruption. The connectivity which made eBay possible also allowed the firm to centralize its aggregation. 
It allowed it to bring buyers and sellers to a central point, its website, and there the traffic could be channeled. It could have a tariff placed on all of its transactions. If you think about it, that's how eBay makes its money, because in the virtual marketplace, the sellers pay rent in the form of a transaction fee, and of course that transaction fee is carried off to the buyer. Centralization is a form of market friction in that it grants whoever holds the central point the power to act as taxman and toll booth and censor. For example, Apple has been notorious for the strict controls that it puts upon apps available for the iOS store. If your iPhone app does something that Apple doesn't like or it perceives as a potential competitive threat, that's it. Apple has the power to deny you access to its installed base. Because the hyperconnectivity of iOS devices would normally allow the peer-to-peer -peer transfer of software and other items of value, those market frictions had to be engineered into the operating system. Now, market frictions become harder to maintain as we become more hyperconnected. The recording industry profited enormously off the transition to digital when we all bought CD collections. Because the friction associated with distributing digital music, hundreds and hundreds of megabytes, was simply too hard for everyone to overcome. However, through time, compression techniques improved and improved, and broadband spread throughout the developed world, and the barriers to peer-to-peer -peer distribution of music progressively collapsed. We're now sufficiently hyper-connected that it's not only technically possible to build a peer-to-peer -peer competitor to eBay, but it's inevitable because hyper-connectivity tends through time to remove all of the frictions in a market. The frictions that eBay uses to generate revenue are being smoothed away by a diffuse, distributed, decentralized, and global aggregation of buyers and sellers. It's less bizarre than switchboard. It's more map-reduced than website. And the same fate will eventually befall Uber and Airbnb and Zarly. Any business that seeks to conduct an aggregation-based arbitrage. Hyperconnectivity does not support inefficiencies needed to make these businesses continuing successes. They're all intermediate forms. They're all leveraging the brief moment between the disconnected and the hyperconnected world. Now the transition to hypereconomics, which is economics where friction has vanished. That has a few years left to run. The sudden rise of firms like Zarly and Freelancer.com has given us some sense of what the labor market's soon going to look like. We will all be gigging rather than working. Our gigs may be small tasks, ephemeral moments when we contribute our particular expertise to an overall project, even if that expertise is simply being in the right place at the right time. Now, as we move further into the hyper-economy, we will be learning how to assemble value chains from the resources available to us. We need to be able to bring together this material with that design expertise, married to a fabrication capability, and then delivered via the appropriate transportation logistics. When we can do that, Every individual will have the same capability to fashion assembly, an assembly line that Henry Ford once commanded. Now, to do this right now, in 2011, would be difficult. The amount of friction associated with many of these tasks is still quite high. And indeed, because that friction is so high, Ruslan Kogan is still in business. We, as individuals, may be hyper-connected, but businesses we run have not yet grasped the nettle of hyperconnectivity. Businesses have not moved to reduce the friction which frames their sales channels. Only a small percent of businesses present their sales channel through a website, and only a tiny portion of those provide any sort of interface, an application programming interface, an API, which would allow those channels to be rolled into a more flexible, larger tool. 
And this is the gap. This is the great opportunity in this present moment because every commercial entity, that's whether it's an individual offering up labor and expertise or an organization offering products and services, every one of them will soon be presenting themselves through an interface that removes all of the frictions associated with the business transaction. Let's use Kogan as an example. I tried to get Russell in here tonight. He was not able to come. It's a shame. With the appropriate APIs to the manufacturers of LCD panels and television electronics and electronics assembly and transport, I could have a TV built to order. Now, that sounds like it might be a little bit of work. But once someone has put together the appropriate supply chain by mashing up the correct APIs, that supply chain can be shared. I won't have to do much more than call up a widget on my mobile and press the order button. And so seen in this way, the transportation that's provided by Uber, the materials on offer on eBay, the design consultancy facilitated by freelance.com, those are no longer destinations in themselves. But they're APIs, and each one is offering a specific element in a production value chain. The recipe which strings them together, turning an idea into reality, the recipe is the innovation. And it's an innovation that can only emerge where friction has been removed in every item of the recipe via an API. And like everything else within the culture of hyperconnectivity, these recipes are going to be shared around communities of expertise. People who care about televisions will share recipes to cook up custom models. People who care about coffee or cookware or carpeting will be able to do exactly the same thing. Being part of a community of expertise gives you access to all of the production value chains associated with that community. And this is already true. If you think about hobbyists trading tips on why, where to find particular bits of kit or how to find a particularly rare recording, they're already doing it. But of course, right now, enough for, uh, friction exists to keep these production value chains very short. But as that friction disappears, production chains grow long enough that they span the whole distance between raw material to finished product. Now, a hundred years ago, Henry Ford established the River Rouge assembly plant. And when he did so, he needed nothing more than iron, sand, coke, and raw rubber, basic ingredients. And from those, he produced millions and millions of Model Ts because River Rouge encompassed a production chain that was able to refine, fabricate, and assemble every single part of an automobile. We are at the threshold of a similar individual industrial revolution. So as businesses publish their APIs, customers gain an unprecedented control over the means of production. That means that a given customer can optimize for price or delivery time or carbon footprint, or any number of other variables, crafting a production value chain which precisely meets their needs. One remaining friction point within the system is financial. Businesses can present themselves globally to a market of customers via an API. But flows of capital remain stubbornly territorial. They're hemmed in by the macroeconomic policies of central banks, which block flows of capital in order to bring stability to national economies. And so that friction has always made global commerce difficult. It's created a place in the value chain for import-export arbitrage. It's interesting because as soon as the world became sufficiently hyperconnected for these frictions to start to become a barrier to commerce, PayPal popped up. And using PayPal, it's possible to transfer funds internationally almost instantly with very little effort. PayPal made eBay internationally viable, and that's why eBay bought PayPal back in 2002. Now, while it's conceivable that PayPal could become a financial API and capitalize all of the pieces in a production value chain, PayPal 
like eBay, is an artifact of the transition into hyperconnectivity. It's an arbitrageur which exploits imperfections in hyperconnectivity. Once everyone is directly connected, it's possible to transfer capital between peers without any need for an exchange service. Now, given the capital flow controls of central banks, we will not be able to use fiat currencies in transactions that cross international boundaries. Instead, individuals and organizations will begin to develop their own exchange mechanisms. Perhaps they'll be based on precious metals, which would be a de facto return to the gold standard, or more likely they'll be virtual currencies such as kilowatt hours or abstract labor units or other measures of commonly agreed value. Now, it's not necessary within all of the parties within a value chain to agree to use a standard currency. Where multiple currencies exist, trading markets are going to flourish, again, accessible via APIs. Now, currency transfer is a point, pardon me, currency conversion is a point of friction. But an API-based approach to currency conversion makes any virtual currency portable enough that its use presents little friction. Now, if all of this sounds a little bit fanciful, consider the recent introduction of bitcoins. They're a cryptographically secure virtual currency. It only has value relative to itself, but it can be exchanged for fiat currencies like dollars and pounds and euros across a wide range of websites. Several of these websites offer APIs. And a number of businesses now accept payment in bitcoins although the currency has been much more influential as an idea than as a medium of exchange. But it points the way toward the idea of a hyper-currency, which is designed to slot smoothly into the frictionless universe of hyper-economics. Now, as more businesses present themselves with APIs ready to be mashed up into production value chains, the need for a frictionless medium of exchange will become more pronounced. And just as PayPal came along to take eBay global, a hypercurrency is going to arrive on the scene just as we need it because there will be a global demand for it. And as capital migrates from friction-filled friction national and international finance markets into hyper-economic frameworks, Institutions dependent upon those frictions will be threatened. Banks will not be able to collect interest. Governments will not be able to tax. Customs duties and user fees are the only ways that governments are going to be able to generate revenue. And courts won't be able to seize assets. The peculiar arrangement of laws and regulations which keep our economic system stable will grow increasingly meaningless. Now, governments and courts are going to try to follow capital into these hyper-economic zones, but they're going to learn there that their mechanisms of control and enforcement are poorly matched to such a fluid environment. Many businesses will not welcome a broadly frictionless hyper-economic environment because they have adapted themselves to profit from those frictions. And so that resistance leaves those businesses vulnerable to competitors who will be offering the same products and services via APIs. Businesses will be forced to change their sales channels or they're simply going to wither away. Australia somehow managed to avoid the allure of retail e-commerce for 15 years. But now, retailers see their businesses being hollowed out as Australian consumers find online shopping sufficiently frictionless that it is now attracting their dollars. So the decision to ignore e-commerce was a mistake that is now proving fatal to Australia's retailers. If we want to avoid massive business failures, we must learn from this mistake. The future doesn't look like the recent past. It, there aren't going to be massive, comprehensive websites offering everything to everyone. The future belongs to tight, focused APIs of products and services written to be easy to use, easy to mash up, easy to share, and easy to roll into other tools. 
The future belongs to businesses which can effortless, effortlessly accept payment in any currency that the customer cares to offer. The future belongs to entrepreneurs building tools that can make constructing a production value chain as simple a matter as dragging and dropping a few icons on an iPad screen. And the future belongs to the hyperconnected who are learning to skate on this very slippery ice. So what happens when there's no more friction anywhere? Well, open your APIs. We're about to find out. Thank you. I'll let you have a drink, Mark. Thank you. That was obviously incredibly thought-provoking, I know, for everybody here. I think, for me, there was a couple of really strong messages in that, and I think, Mark, you wrapped it up really beautifully at the end when you said the, the future belongs to the entrepreneurs. One of the, the themes that just kept coming through to me was fluidity and the, the, the pace of change and, and how organisations need to, to keep up with that and need to keep reinventing over and over again, otherwise they'll eventually become the victim of what made them successful in the first place. Right. Well, they're damned if they do, if they're damned if they don't, because changing your sales channel means disrupting your sales mechanism. There's, exactly. no, there's no comfortable way of doing that for a business that's currently got a workable sales channel. But look at Jerry Harvey, look at Meyer, look mm. at David Jones. You don't want to end up like them. Absolutely. A perfect segue, I guess, now for everybody in the audience to take the opportunity to, to do some q and I'll do my best to get around the audience with my portable mic so again we capture everything on the definitely have a first question already lined up which is great uh, so I'll work my way around please when we do questions please keep them as succinct as possible so we can make the best use of the the short time that we have with Mark so uh, do we have a, a first question first of all Thank you very much, Mark, for the good news. <laughs> and I think it's good. Thank you for taking it so well. And I think it's good news not just for the EU activists and the people occupying Wall Street at this time, because mm -hmm. what you seem to be opening is the best way to get back at the system of currency is to make currency irrelevant. And it seems to be opening the doorway to that. Anyway, that's my question. Is that the direction where it could possibly go? It's not. It's, I mean, you're not going to make currency irrelevant because people will always need a medium of exchange. It's whether you're making fiat currencies irrelevant. And I'm not doing that. All right? This is doing that. You can blame Steve Jobs. All right? For that. Um, that it's, it's simply a side effect of the hyperconnectivity. One thing that we never think about, we always think of money as being a very physical medium, but money is actually information. I had a bit of an epiphany today after I'd actually gotten all the work done thinking, well, of course, this is happening to money because money is information. And therefore, when you changed, when you make the communication medium pervasive, money is now completely free. There's no blocks around the mobility of money. Now, this is not going to be utopia. We should be really clear about this. This is not going to be some sort of socialist utopia because there are going to be people who will be able to learn how to leverage hyper economy hyper connectivity to actually bring enormous capital flows to them instantaneously that sort of comes as the same uh, comes out of the same can as everything else you can already see bits and pieces of this by the fact that Mark Zuckerberg at 28 is the richest person, one of the richest people on the planet now. So his, his man, uh, method of capital accumula uh, accumulation, which was by hyper-connecting people in Facebook, caused an enormous capital communication, uh, accumula accumulation really quickly. We will see similar things. Hopefully most of them will be based on productive activity rather than speculative activity, but I don't think there's any guarantee of that. Any more questions? I'm sure there's a few more out here. Uh, what do you see as some of the solutions to the uh, friction, as you call it, that, that governments put in, uh, put in place? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be prescriptive here about this. Um, when the Australian government loses its ability to tax, we're going to lose Medicare. 
which will be kind of upsetting. And so we're going to have to figure out other ways of being able to fund the services that we offer. Now, the thing that um, governments have always been good at, again, I says it's customs, all right? And so it may very well be that things that reside purely in the, the realm of the physical, because they are physical, can be taxed. And so we may accept a much broader almost the equivalent of a GST, which is, is, is very much around physical things, even though services gets taxed, or, but it would be a goods tax. And there may be a much more pervasive goods tax around that. Um, and uh, so governments will have to adapt to the degree that populations want governments to be able to adapt. Governments will scramble, but so much of this is already happening sort of outside of their purview, it's not clear that they'll be able to stay in front of it. That's a very good question, though, and I don't have a really great answer yet. Um, you talked about um, central facilitators like eBay, right. and like the people who are connecting everybody who are the intermediary at the right. moment, and they'll be replaced by APIs. But aren't the people then who write the APIs becoming the central fa the facilitators? No, because the APIs are going to live here. In other words, the APIs will go from here to everything. So, if there's the APIs are centralized, all right? There's going to be a number of people who will be able to offer me, unless I'm the only person who can offer X, right? There's going to be a number of different people or things, entities, offering the same API, and I can pick and choose which API I want for a particular task. So in other words, yeah. the API is being offered in a distributed way. It's being offered by everyone in the marketplace. So every one of the individuals on this planet will have their own personal set of APIs, and then every business that's offering a service or a good will also have their own APIs for those. So there's no aggregation point for those APIs. There's just simply out there, and you use them by connecting directly to them. Is that clearer? Yeah, but you still have to have somebody who produces each in API. Yeah, but wouldn't that be the firm itself? This is, well, this is one reason why I made such a point. I said this is the, this is the um, opportunity in the current moment because all the businesses are going to need these APIs. Now, you're right. There's a place where someone could be an, uh, a very successful arbitrageur by producing enough of these APIs, and that's a business opportunity, all right? But that will eventually be disintermediated because those people will actually want their own APIs because an API will be power, and you'll want to preserve that power for your own business. Okay? Theoretically. I mean, I see, I see your point. I think you raised a really interesting point, Mark, but from my uh, experience in enterprise IT mm -hmm. over the years, um, the thought of proposing an architectural solution, which an API is yes. to a business, just the mental map that I would have to spend time creating in people who would have to make and fund that decision terrifies me. Yes. And so effectively that means that, that any organization that has that problem, and any of the ASX 200 pretty much have that problem, is going to be disintermediated by smaller, nimbler players. So that's the, it's the elephant's graveyard. Oops. That's what you're saying, isn't it? Well, I'm not. I'm not. I mean, I'm obviously saying that it would be a good idea to not be a dinosaur while the asteroid is coming. Um, but it is, it is a decision. I mean, you, we have seen amazing examples of companies that can pivot, and can, that can radically change themselves and, and, and pursue different sales channels. This, it does happen. It's not without precedent. It's simply as rare as hen's teeth, right? I, I mean, that, 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 that's part of what's going on right now. We see large segments of the production economy simply falling apart. And I think part of why they're falling apart is because they actually can't fit into a hyper-connected culture because people themselves, we all in our individual lives are living hyper-connected, but the businesses that we work for and the organizations we work with aren't. So there's a disconnect there and that disconnect is causing those organizations to stutter. So yeah, you're right. Either they move forward and stop stuttering or they, they gradually fall apart. Uh, just a, a quick question about um, another dead man walking industry, like uh, book publishers. Mm. Now in Australia, I love book publishers. We have <laughs> we have a protectionism 
yes. um, that the, the, the regulators have basically put in place to help uh, publishers to, to stop having e-books, for instance, come into us under the guise of cheap imported books. Yeah. Um, so government could actually stop this in its tracks by creating these sorts of regulations. How do you think that's going to go? Uh, I think that's not going to work very well. Um, yeah, it has, I mean, given that I can go to Booko or Book Depository and get any book that I want in basically two days, right, at, a, at the same price that an American's going to be paying for it on Amazon, um, it doesn't seem that, it, I, I think governments ha are capable of slowing it down. Books are, are a particularly thorny thing because books are data, books are information, they're not physical objects. So you can slow a couch down, but you can't slow a book down. You can slow um, a car down, you can't slow a movie down. This is the thing. And so... So there's some Australian publishers, for instance, will not allow Amazon to sell you a book they can sell to an American to you as an Australian unless you cheat the system by saying you're not an Australian. Well, you no, no, no. Book. You can go on Book Depository. I'm not breaking any laws when I use no, Book no. Depository. No, no. So if you go to Book Depository and you yeah. try and buy um, the, the latest Booker Prize, Temple's uh, book, right. they won't sell it to you. You cannot buy it from Amazon or Book Depository right. because the Australian publisher has the right to sell that book in Australia and no one else. Okay. It's, a, it's a regulation. For right, right. No, I, I'm, familiar, I'm familiar with the, um, the regulation. Um, you don't really want to get me started on this. <laughs> this is another whole conversation. Um, what happens is uh, the more hyperconnected an environment becomes, the more quickly pressures build up around these points of friction and these points of resistance. And so the more quickly it is that pressure will come up against any particular point, and that point will be smoothed away. So the more that the book industry slash government presents a point of resistance around it, the more pressure ends up at that point. So you need to just sort of think of it that way, that there's, a, there's, a, there's an almost automatic nature to this. All right? So while it may not get rid of the example for a single book, for books as a class, it's going to be, there's only going to be more and more pressure around that. All right. And governments are going to be incredibly resistant to this because, again, this is, the, this is the sort of fundamental ability to tax is based out of being able to control particular material flows. Uh, very interesting talk so far. Just a, a question. Governments and legisla legislation, lawmakers, etc., tend to follow along in react mode mm. after the economy mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. after a trend has actually been established. Right. So there's a reaction time that's involved in some of this. Yes. Two questions, I guess. First of all, what do you think the reaction time of governments to this sort of approach will be? And secondly, what do you think their reaction might be? So, um, I mean, let's pull the room. Who thinks that the government's actually, actually encountered e-commerce in a meaningful way yet, which is now 15 years old? Yeah, that's what I thought. All right, so we're already 15 years beyond e-commerce, and we're now getting into the next thing after e-commerce, which is something that looks a little more like hyper-economy. Um, so they're now going to be two generations behind here. The problem being that they, I mean, they'll be forced into reactive mode because weird things will start to happen because things can happen so quickly and so fluidly now. And so weird capital formations and um, architectures of finance and whatnot will become more common because they, because they can become more common. And so that's going to raise their attention, whether the government has an apparatus suitable to being able to first apprehend it and then actually be able to encompass it. I don't have an answer. That said, I always think that part of the transition that we're making into hyperconnectivity is that we should stop thinking about government as that. We should start thinking about government as us and how would we then think about working with these flows, all right? Because we live in a democracy. We are all relatively equally empowered to be able to actually act. And in fact, because the government as this thing over there its power to act, it's becoming now more impingent upon us to be able to act and to think about, well, what does it mean to actually do with to a certain thing? Just to that, that three years ago, John Howard, when he was Prime Minister, um, legislated against online gambling by making sure that Australian organisations couldn't take up a licence to create online casinos. Mm -hmm. um, and he thought that would solve the problem. So therefore, everyone just started using online casinos out Overseas. of the Islands or whatever. Right. Because it was all done electronically over the internet. Right. He thought he would solve a problem by making sure Australians couldn't do it. And it right. just effectively meant that they logged onto a different web address. Right, right. And now, of course, Australians can gamble online all they like. Yeah. So, so I, I, that's what kind of raised my question, whether yeah. we're 
heading into this sort of lag position where we're going to have people making laws or legislating who do not actually understand what is going on. We're not heading into it. We're 15 years in it. That's the problem. Hi, um, Mark. I was just wondering why you, um, Australia or us or our government decided not to make the decision to move or be visionary. Do you have any um, thoughts on that? How do you mean? I mean well, the we're NBN 15... Is, the NBN, and I talk to people in America who are in awe of the NBN. I talk to people at the FCC. But we're 15 years behind from that point. Oh, from e-commerce. Yeah, yeah e-commerce. Okay, so that was... This is, this is something I don't actually understand because I arrived after that decision happened. And I arrived here in, two, uh, in 2003 and went, where's Amazon? And went, and have since, in, in the preceding, in the last eight years, have learned somehow to live without Amazon. I'm not quite sure how that happened, but I have managed to carry on without Amazon. Um, uh, and so we kind of live in this weird bubble because Australians are fundamentally incredibly well connected. We have smartphone penetration outpacing everyone on the planet right now. So we obviously have the infrastructure and the awareness for it, but business Business is very conser retail business certainly is a very conservative in this country and has I, been. I was actually in the rooftop in those days, so I can actually answer that question. Um, in the dot com bust, uh, all of the major retailers in Australia, all the top ones, including the shopping centres and stuff, had online shopping ready to go. And when the bubble burst, they put it on the shelf and just went, thank God we don't have to do that. Actually, he was in a meeting with Jerry Harvey in the early 2000s where I was sort of saying the future is online shopping and he just went, I don't think so, it's just still, you know. Um, and I have had a pretty great pleasure in saying it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a very hard, heartfelt view, view that the business model they had was sustainable and they didn't understand that Amazon could come here and compete on their own turf without coming here. Right. But they also didn't understand that it, that it left ground for a Kogan to pop up and establish his own value chain. That's, that's, you know, the mistake isn't that you're going to be undermined by Amazon. The mistake is going to be undermined by a 25-year-old. <laughs> it's all right, we'll give them Queensland, we'll get Google, it'll be fine. Can we do that? Hi, Mark. Um, I was just thinking about some of the things you were saying towards the end of your presentation where you were leading up to a penultimate move to some kind of global exchange of mm. currency, of mm -hmm. value, etc. But currencies are based on confidence. And they're yeah, also grounded are, certainly. In, and, but they're also grounded often in physical objects, gold or... No, they aren't. What it, Fiat currencies are not. The only thing that's grounded in gold is gold. I don't even think the Swiss franc is grounded in gold anymore. Oh, okay. There are, there are, <laughs> the only, there are, we, we left the gold standard in 1972, was it, with, uh, with um, the end of Bretton Woods, I think? Mm -hmm. And that was it. After that, and of course, you know, the gold blugs basically think that that was the end of history when we left the gold standard. And so all currencies are based on one another right now, which is, which is fine. And that's, and bitcoins are based on one another right now but they're not subject to central bank capital flows. All right. Now, the interesting thing is, and I took this actually out of the talk, but because there's no central bank in Bitcoin land, uh, you can, and I had the, the chart of the Bitcoin uh, um, exchange value relative to the US dollar over the last six months, whoosh, whoosh, there, was a, there was a bubble and a crash because there were speculators involved in buying Bitcoins. And a central bank would normally either buy or sell currency in order to smooth out those speculative bubbles, there's no one to do it in Bitcoin land. So because it's a true currency, that's a hyper currency, it can just go like that. And that's, that, that will happen. That's the danger of using a frictionless currency. Because it doesn't have any friction. <laughs> All right. In other words, the not having a friction has to have, has to outweigh the potential dangers of it. And the question is, will that do it in every situation? All right. Um, I was talking to the fellow who heads up PR at eBay, in, uh, pardon me, at PayPal in Australia. I invited him to be here tonight. I didn't tell him I was going to kill his company, but I did invite him to be here. And, um, and 
you know, he said, look, at the reason people use us rather than a credit card is because we're, we, we offer, we, you have to give up less information when you use PayPal, so it's a more secure transaction, and that's why we get to charge more for it. So there could be some kinds of virtual currencies that would have an enormous trust value associated with them, but that would have some friction in terms of an interest, all right? But they could still be frictionless or ha carry less friction than a fiat, a state fiat currency. Or there could be currencies that are completely wild and woolly and people will just be using them like crazy because it suits their moment. That's what, I don't think there's going to be a one-size-fits-all answer to what a hypercurrency is. I think there's going to be horses for courses. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Very, very interesting presentation. Um, while I'm listening to you, the word politics and power is going through my mind all the time. Mm. And we focused on the governments and government regulatory responses to these issues. What, what you're conveying tonight is a revolutionary mes message. Uh, but my question is around the corporate world. Mm. We focus on the government, but as the notorious mm. person interviewed on BBC this last week said, Governments don't run the world anymore. Goldman, uh, Goldman Sachs, Sachs runs, runs the world. world. Now, what I see in the corporate world is we've got uh, we've got organizations, uh, and 80% of us are still employed in organizations mm. structured as functional hierarchies. Yes. Um, they have not adapted. That's an industrial era form of, of structure. Right. They have not adapted, and they haven't had to adapt it. No. So to what extent are we going to be resisted by the corporate world? And I'm thinking, again, of the potential yeah, for, for example, internal labor markets in right. organizations, which right. is massive, uh, and the freedom that that brings yeah. to the so-called knowledge economy, which I haven't seen any signs of in, yeah. in everyday practice, yeah. um, those issues bother me. W you know, is the power structure such that as revolutionary as this message is, it's doomed not to work? Oh, oh well, okay. It, we, it, we aren't going to be putting our phones down. And that's the thing, is that basically what I'm talking about, this is in a sense, what I'm describing is a series of feedbacks. All right, I'm not describing processes that really can be affected by human intervention. Well, this is a process that we are embedded in. All right, and I guess that's what I'm talking about. And that's actually what the book, the first book, The Next Billion Seconds, is about. It actually takes the point of view that this is a process that we're embedded in, as opposed to a process where we have, we have some agency, in that we can, in some sense, kind of direct things, but we don't have agency over drawing the curtain on this. We don't, all right? We don't have agency around the fact that hierarchy is now incompatible with um, the way human beings need to share information or most effectively share information. And so one of the fundamental conclusions at the beginning of the book is that, inf um, organization, that hierarchy is fundamentally antithetical to the network. And I am not the first person to come up with that. That's been a consistent theme from probably the last 50 years since the, the um, Macy conferences, actually 60 years from the Macy conferences. Um, but now we're actually in a world where we have that connectivity, and so we're starting to see those stresses against hierarchical organizations. You don't have to spell the doom. You don't have to wage war against them. It's just that a group of people who are sufficiently well-connected think faster and move faster and are smarter than that organization, and so it's a natural selection process. All right, that's why I don't, it's not revolutionary, it's um, perhaps more terrifying than revolutionary. Um, a few years ago, we had a, an artifact called Second Life, and people were going to live in Second Life, <laughs> and they were going to buy stuff with their uh, fake money and oh, live in fake God. houses. You had to mention Second Life. <laughs> Come on, talk about the flying penises. Yeah. So, so I guess, I guess my, my, my question is, that was also based on a similar philosophy that uh, you, we, they're going to create a world that's going to have less friction, you'll be able to do stuff. Right. How, how is this different? Yeah, because and I'm not creating it. <laughs> 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 All right. The, I mean, Second Life is, was entirely synthetic in that sense, right? It has synthetic currency. It was synthetic in, in every possible sense, All right. And s nothing about what I'm talking about is synthetic. This is simply drawing out of what's going on right now. And so you don't have to, nothing here is forced. Everything here is simply happening. It's, it's an engine that's overheating. Um, so it's not, I, I, the interesting thing is, is that the virtual worlds, and one reason why I can actually talk about these things is because I was doing virtual worlds research 20 years ago. And when you're actually in an entirely synthetic environment, an environment that you created and defined all the rules for, you actually start to think very differently and profoundly philosophically. They, they, you know how they say there's no atheists in foxholes? There were no atheists in VR. 
all right? Because there was something that's so philosophically profound about being in a created environment, either you created it or someone else, that forced you to start to ask a series of questions. And this, these, this represents some of my answers to those questions that we asked. So I think that Second Life, which is still used somewhat by educators today, and I, I shouldn't put it down because I know that the folks who invented Second Life were heavily influenced by my own research in the 90s. Um, but I, I, I don't particularly like it because I never saw the point of having an entirely synthetic world. But other people use it for very specific purposes. But those, it becomes a tool for thinking. And, and that was very good for its time. So for the mid-2000s, it was a great tool for thinking. Now, the only tool that you need for thinking about the virtual world, this. Um, just the last point, I don't think we've really discussed too much, is financial markets. How are they going to react to all this? I mean, if market capitalization right. for corporations is eventually eroded, um, banking systems, how do I get a mortgage if... Um, Zopa. Do we all know about Zopa? Zopa is peer-to-peer -peer lending. It is now licensed and chartered in England. I think they're trying to move to America now. So again, it's possible to have peer-to-peer -peer lending. You think about microfinance, Grameen Bank, right? In pocket. Well, that's peer-to-peer -peer lending, but it's microfinance levels. Well, it actually works when you scale it up for grown-ups, all right, for developed economies. So you can actually get people to pool their superannuation, their savings, their whatever, and that then becomes a resource pool. Is that mine? No, good. Um, this is also, I mean, that's, uh, for all of us who have seen It's a Wonderful Life, right? There's that wonderful scene where the bank's about to go under. It's, I know your money's in Charlie's house, and, but that's, that's how a, a savings and loan has always worked. So it's that same model. I think we're going to have finer instruments for it and so that they will be able to form more rapidly. Of course, the interesting thing is it's going to be a boom time for lawyers because there's going to need to be contracts that can actually accommodate all of this. Yeah, there's always going to be lawyers. That's good news. I'll still be in a job working <laughs> for a law firm. <laughs> Any other questions? We've got one at the back with Dylan. Just Social adaptation is something that has me a little bit perplexed. In the first part of your talk, you spoke about traditional places like, like Kenya and, and Pakistan and India and, and the way that they've adapted to technology. In... In Western markets, we, we have the privilege of having technology and have had so for a while. Right. Uh, does this really open up that platform for global economic shift more so now than ever before? Okay. Well, it does because there are, it's because everyone's now playing in that platform. So in 1995, which is why I sort of set the beginning point of the billion seconds there, 1% had access to the internet and about 1% had mobile phones, about 60 million either way, all right? And so in 2011, we now have 2.5 billion people with regular internet access and 5.5 billion people with mobiles. And so just in those terms, you now have a very different scope of possibilities. And I, I mean, again, this is sort of the material that's being covered in the first book. One of the processes that's underway now is a process of what I call I use the word hyper a lot because it's a good, uh, adju uh, good modifier. Hypermimesis. Mimesis is imitation. What's happening is someone's seeing someone do something, like the, fa the fishermen were all watching, oh, that guy's got a mobile, I've got to get a mobile and do the same thing. All right? So people are learning behaviors that allow them to become more effective using their communication tool, and they're sharing it because that's part of what you do when you communicate is you share. And so what's happening is the entire human race is now rapidly learning and sharing new techniques to improve their capability. So that's what's different than, say, 15 years ago. And that's sort of the basic thesis of the next billion seconds. We have going okay for time. If, if there's a couple more questions, if not, we can, we can start to gather things up. We'll have one more. All right, one more, please, because I'm getting tired. Oh, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I do kind of, I guess, worry a little bit about the morals and things and, and wonder who's the winners are going to be like we can all get really really cheap stuff from China because right. they exploit Chinese workers type right. questions right and and, and that to get and, and then I guess the other part of the question is so so who is going to win I mean is it the smart people is it the people that have got cheap labor is it the right. people that are prepared to do dirty stuff um my research tends to think that it's the it's not so much the smart, it's the well-networked, all right? In other words, it's not really just about you, it's about who you know. 
as it always has been. All right? But now, who you know is what you know. They're, they're starting to become interchangeable. And so the future that I predict in the next billion seconds is something that looks more tribal than organizational, where we come out of this sort of hierarchical form. We're going to something that looks more tribal, but has the same footprint in terms of its ability to command resources as a classical organization does. And so there are going to be, the future is, um, you know, there's this lovely um, uh, Latin phrase, which is the um, omnium bellum contra omnis, the war of all against all, which is from Hobbes. And that's the human condition. It was the human condition 10,000 years ago. It's the human condition 50 years from now. I don't think it's actually going to be open warfare, but human beings aren't going to be less competitive when they learn to be more cooperative. We're going to be both more cooperative and competitive. Thank you. I would like to say a big thank you as well and also just present oh, with a, shampers. a small token of appreciation for giving up his time tonight thank you and very obviously much. Uh, putting a lot of effort into in the presentation tonight. So thank you, Mark. Thank you. All right. I'm sure there'll be plenty more opportunities for us uh, down the road to continue the conversation. Before we go, there's just a couple of points that I wanted to cover off before we formally close today. Uh, first of all is to say a couple of big thank yous. Obviously events like this take a, a lot of organisation and the Guiding Coalition and the, the community as a whole has really done a fantastic job. So a big thank you to everybody involved in helping out and putting the night together. And I also wanted to remind everybody that we will be distributing a feedback form at the end of the session today. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. One, we want your feedback, obviously. Uh, two, I think it's the least we can provide to Mark is to give him some feedback on his presentation. So there's a few questions in there that are, are very specific uh, to Mark's presentation. Uh, it's also a little bit of a, a bait to get you uh, along to, to fill out that um, present uh, sorry to fill out that feedback form. Once you do that, we'll send you a link with uh, a link to all of the full text transcript of tonight and hopefully a video. So you can go back and refer and um, yeah, watch it over and over again if, if you so desire. Now I just wanted to take one moment, as we all saw Mark is a, a fantastic and, and passionate presenter, but not all of us are. I know Mark's been speaking since his late teens and is, is a natural in front of a large crowd. One of the other initiatives that our uh, community, the ITMP, has put together is a Toastmasters Club. The details are here, there's quite a few people from the Toastmasters Club here tonight, myself included. Um, I might just get the few other people here just to stand up so you can see who they are. So when we're at the, at the pub later, if you are interested in Toastmasters, please just approach any one of these people or myself. If you're interested, we've also got some brochures around about the club. Apart from growing your confidence and your public speaking skills, um, it's a really great social environment and somehow we always end up at the same place we're about to end up at after, <laughs> after this meeting. So I think that covers off just about everything. I'll pop one last slide up for you, the most important one of the evening. That's how to get to the pub. Thank you very much for your attendance tonight. Thank you very much, Mark. I hope everybody has a good night, and I look forward to catching up with you for a beer down the road. Thanks very much. <laughs>